Hello, everyone. In this episode, I am joined by Spencer Bish Bishens. Hey. <laughs> I don't think I we discussed how to say your last name. Yeah, <laughs> Bishens. Bishens, just like it's spelled. Well, Spencer, um, again, thank you for joining me today. Um, please um share who you are. Like, who is Spencer? Yeah, thanks for having me. So Spencer went to law school and graduated in 2008 and came out and was a lawyer and didn't really know exactly what Spencer, I will stop talking in the third person. I didn't know really what I wanted to be doing at that point. I had dabbled a little bit in criminal law in law school, but I wasn't sure like what I wanted to do long term, which was actually really good because in 2008, I'm sure you remember, it wasn't a great time to be entering the job market or to try and be particularly picky, right? <laughs> and that was the same with lawyers. It was like, you know, you kind of get whatever you can find for employment. And I was right out of law school, so I didn't have any experience. And so I wasn't the most marketable attorney, even though I was a licensed attorney. So it took me a couple of years to get a full-time job. And I was applying with like every federal agency I could possibly find because we were living in DC at the time. And social security is what stuck. They're the ones who wanted to hire me. And so when people ask me how I ended up with social security, by complete accident. Um, but I ended up working as a, an attorney with the social security administration near Washington, DC at their headquarters. And uh, I was an attorney advisor, and my job was to do disability claims. And like, I think like most Americans, I did not even know Social Security had a disability program when I started. Because like, who knew? I mean, I, I don't know, um, like how familiar your you or your listeners are with Social Security, but I was a lawyer and I had no <laughs> idea. I just hear, I, I would hear social security and like most Americans, I think like, yeah, but like, don't you have to be 65 or something to get social security? And so I was really starting from scratch, just like most people, but then ended up staying 11 years. And during that time, I wrote almost 2000 disability decisions for administrative law judges. And I reviewed a few thousand more on appeal. And so during that time, as you can imagine, with this pretty decent sample size of cases, I was able to learn a lot about how social security operates. And I was able to make lots of observations and understand where people get caught in the giant bureaucracy that is the federal government. Um, most of us try to avoid government bureaucracy at all costs, right? And like, if we have to renew our passport or go to the DMV, that's like the biggest stressor of our week, possibly. Um, and of course, I'm not even going to touch like income tax return <laughs> time in April. Nobody <laughs> wants to deal with the government. If you're dealing with the government, most likely it's something that's either gone wrong or even if it's something you need, like a passport, you just think it's going to be a huge hassle. And Social Security is no exception. But I wanted to try and make the process just a little bit easier for people by explaining to people what the social security disability program is, how it operates, where people get tripped up, where the agencies put specific intentional barriers in your way in order to trip you up, and ultimately overall give people a guide for how to be able to give yourself the best possible chance if you are in the unfortunate situation of being hurt, injured, have a chronic illness, for any reason you can't work due to a disability, I wanted to be able to give people the tools to know how to get through the system to give themselves the best possible chance at success. So I did what anyone would do in my situation. I wrote a book, <laughs> Social Security Disability Revealed. And I wanted the subtitle to let people know in one sentence exactly what it's all about. I tell you why it's so hard to access benefits, all those barriers that will be in your way, whether you think about them as barriers or not, whether you know they're there or not, all the reasons it's going to be difficult for you. But also, I want to tell people how they can get around these barriers. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, right? Barriers are hard to get around. 
a yeah. lot of these things are there to make it difficult for you. And at no point in the subtitle do I promise it's going to be easy, but I am trying to at least tell you the things you can do about uh, when you get to those barriers and obstacles to give yourself the best possible chance of a successful disability claim. So Spencer is a lawyer who worked for Social Security for 11 years, realized from writing a lot of approvals, but also a lot of denials, even for people who had really good medical evidence and who I thought were disabled and unable to work, I still wrote a lot of denials. And so I wanted to explain to people here are the reasons that might happen. Here are the reasons your claim might be denied. And there are certain things you, you can do about that to try and prevent that from happening. And I wanted to be able to impart that knowledge on people with my book. I love that. And this is probably like the first time a topic has intertwined with something in my life recently. Okay. Um. So I have an internship um, because I'm studying graphic design and it's the final step for me to be done with school and out into the workforce like everyone else. Um, and um, part of the task or the main task primarily is to create infographics, you know, promoting an event, information to make sure it's marketable because I, I work on campus for my internship so the school can promote it and share it amongst the universe. And one of the events was disability in the workforce. Um, so I find it interesting how, you know, obviously you're talking about social security with disability, but that yeah. also ties into people who have disabilities being able to work in like a common job, like a bank or a supermarket. So I just love that those two topics intertwine because in order to get any sense of social security, disability you have to I think have some work experience I'm not entirely sure how that yeah to, in order to earn the social security credits to be part of the insurance program you have to work and pay the social security tax or if you're self-employed it's the self-employment tax on your tax return but if you're an employee if you work for someone else and you get a paycheck and a pay stub if you look at your pay stub you'll see three taxes coming out of your pay stub Maybe more if you have a state or local tax, but at least three. The federal income tax, that goes to Congress and they get to spend it however they want. And then, but also the Social Security and Medicare tax. And it's the Social Security tax that specifically goes to fund the retirement program, but also that same tax funds the disability program. So even people who don't know that they're covered for disability insurance, they are if they're paying that tax and they've earned a certain number of credits. And I explain what the programs are, how those credit systems work. I explain that in the book because that's the thing is the government doesn't teach us how this works, right? right? No one tells you how government programs work or how social security works. This is kind of something you like hear from other people or you pick up through movies or whatever. You're like, I know there's social security and I think I get it when I'm old, but no one tells you there's a disability program. There's a very specific reason for that. Social security does not want people claiming disability benefits. Uh... So like any private insurance company, they make it easy to pay in, or in this case, mandatory to pay in and really difficult to get benefits out. Do you happen to have a car? Um, no, but I, um, I don't have but a car. But do you know anyone who has a car? Yes. <laughs> and they're required to have car insurance, right? Yes. I think every state requires you to have some level of car insurance. Right. But no one really teaches you what happens if you need that car insurance, if you get in a car accident. So for most people, the first time it happens, they were like, I don't know what to do. Is this covered by my insurance? I don't know. Same thing with homeowners or renters insurance. You pay for it. And if you buy a home with a mortgage, you're required to have homeowners insurance. But if something goes wrong, no one teaches you how to use it. And that's because insurance companies don't want you making claims. So they don't want you to know how to make a claim. And social security disability is pretty similar. They don't want you to know how to make a disability claim because they really don't want people getting those benefits until they're in their mid to late 60s. And the reason is, if you put in a claim like at your age, for example, you I've haven't paid, 
I've actually tried to um me and my father have tried to do that um because um there's no medical definition for what is that I have because I was two years delayed from the second I was born so I have ADHD and um hyper um I think that's what I just said ADHD hypertension deficit disorder I believe is the right term so right now in my adulthood we're trying to get claims or figure out how I can get benefits because of my deficiencies so right yes it's not can I ask how can I ask how old you are I'm 26 okay so and then I, I will explain that in a reason there's a very specific reason why I've asked and it's something I cover in the book but the definition for social security is any medical impairment or combination of impairments that causes you to be unable to work for a full 12 months can qualify you for disability and the thing is, even if you've only paid into the system for a little bit of time, if you've earned the credits, you can file a disability claim. But the thing is, Social Security doesn't want you pulling out those benefits at your age right. because they, the whole way the system is set up that you pay in for like 40 years and then you get retirement, right? It's not set up for you to pay in for five or 10 years. So if too many people do that, it destabilizes the system financially. But you can still file a claim. So I want your listeners to know if you're in your 20s or 30s, you're still entitled to these benefits just like anyone else. It's just that Social Security isn't going to teach you how to do that, how to get to those benefits. And again, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, because I believe that anyone who pays in and who is told those benefits are there for you should be able to access them. And if Social Security is not going to tell you how to do it, then a former Social Security employee is going to tell you how to do it. Uh, now, real quick, can we pivot back to why I asked you your age? Because it's not an appropriate question. To no, ask it's not. Someone, it's not. Unless it matters legally. And here's why it matters. There's several different kinds of social security claims. And I, of course, everything I'm going to say, I cover in way more detail in the book. But there's two programs. Social security disability insurance is what I've been talking about so far, where you pay the tax, and you get social security coverage. But a lot of young people, and I'll get to the other program in a minute, but a lot of young people haven't paid in to the, haven't worked and paid into the system long enough to have their own coverage. But there's a program for people who have an impairment that began before they turned 22. And so anything that you had in childhood would count, right? Because you had that impairment before 22, where you can file a claim on the earnings record of a parent or guardian who earns the, the credits and has the coverage. That's called a disabled adult child claim. I talk about it in the book. And so it allows people who, the idea is if you had some kind of impairment in childhood, and maybe you could not ever have the opportunity to earn your own credits, right? That's the theory behind this kind of claim. So, let's figure out a way to let you put a claim in on an adult who is your parent or guardian. You can claim on their earnings record and get the amount they would be entitled to, but you can get it. One caveat to this, there's several more requirements that I talk about in the book, but one caveat is the wage earner, so the parent or guardian, has to be either dead, disabled, or retired themselves. In other words, they have to be a social security claimant. Uh -huh. but, but if they're retired, or if they themselves are disabled and unable to work and are getting disability benefits, then the disabled adult child is what the type of claim is called, because you're now an adult, yeah. but your impairment may have onset when you were a child. And so that kind of claim you could then be eligible for. And with both with all SSDI claims, social security disability insurance, including the one I just talked about, you can get Medicare coverage. So again, when I started, I thought Medicare, that's like something my grandparents have, right? Like nobody gets Medicare before 65, but that's not true. If you're found disabled, you can get Medicare coverage. And I know someone who's on Medicare and he's in his thirties because he was found disabled by social security. So that's why I asked you your age, because I, I, it, it's, if you were before 22, it's a no-brainer. You're before 22, of course, you're a parent onset before 22. 
but you can still apply at 26 or 30 or even later. You just have to show the impairment started before you were 22. Right. They need proof of that. And that's where it gets tricky from my end. They need physical proof as far as documentation for the impairment or what it is even. But like your, but your childhood um, medical records. And when I say childhood, I actually just mean anything right. before age 22 would show that you had that impairment on set before age 22. Now, having said that, you still have to be found disabled, which is a pretty strict definition for an adult because you have to show you can't do any full-time work in the national economy. And that's really difficult, right? Because there's work that even someone with ADHD might be able to do, something like laundry folder or dishwasher in a restaurant something that maybe doesn't take a substantial amount of focus and concentration, a judge, I'm not saying I would say this, but a judge might say, eh, there's work you can do so you're not disabled. Real quick, the other program is supplemental security income. And that's for people who didn't pay that tax and didn't earn enough credits. So if you didn't earn enough credits, you could go file on that program also, if your parent or guardian isn't dead, retired, or disabled themselves, you can work and earn your own credits and then file a disability claim. So there's so many different options, but the key is you have to know what these things are and what the requirements are. And they're all really complicated and there's lots of requirements. And so that's why, you know, if, if you like what you're hearing from me right now, that's great, but this isn't all of it. It's a two- <laughs> It's a 260 page book. So I'm really only scratching the surface here. I go into way more detail in the book about the requirements for all these things and what's good about each program, what's not so good about each program and how you might go about qualifying. I love that. I love that you're explaining how the system works in regards to disability, because as someone who has deficiencies and their own onset of issues as a result, of being born, um, trying to prove yourself or be treated equally fairly by a system that tends to destroy us in some sense, it's difficult. So I love that you share how to kind of crack that secret into understanding it and making sure everyone gets what they are owed as far as being treated equally. Yeah, because your impairment it's right there in the title. It's attention deficit yes, hyperactive disorder, right? Attention yeah. deficit, meaning you have some concentration deficits and it's not your fault. It's a medical condition. And it's right there in the title that you may have difficulty concentrating. And yet social security will treat you like anyone else where they're like, you fill out an application. It's going to be lengthy, intensive. There are going to be deadlines. You're going to have to fill out function reports, then get us all your medical records from all your medical sources and make sure there are no gaps in your medical records and make sure you send all those records to us. And, oh, you're not working and don't have health insurance and can't get medical treatment. Sorry, we still need medical records from you to prove the impairment that is the reason you can't work and therefore have no health insurance. It's a baffling system, right? Yeah. And for people who have mental health or other non-visible impairments, depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, possibly physical impairments like fibromyalgia or cancer or HIV. There's so many different reasons, visible and non-visible and mental health, why people can't work. And yet social security puts you through this gauntlet to get the benefits that they call an entitlement because you pay the tax and should be entitled to them, right? Yeah. But then they make it really difficult to get to. And as I said, there, there's a reason that they operate like a private insurance company. It's not that they're a private insurance company for profit per se, but they have to protect the people who are filing for retirement. We need to make sure there's enough money there for the people who are are working 40 years and are filing retirement claims. And they can't deny those people. There's no decision-making capacity on a retirement claim. So the only way they that they can control the outflow of money from the system is by making decisions on disability claims. 
And so if they need to have less outflow, less money going out, then they approve fewer disability cases. And that's unfortunate for people such as yourselves. You're a young person with a mental health disorder that maybe has difficulty working. It's really, really difficult, as I talk about in the book, really difficult for someone under 50 without a substantial physical impairment to be found disabled under social security's rules. And it's because of the definition of disability that you have to show you can't do any full-time work. And if you have difficulty concentrating, difficulty being supervised, difficulty being around other people, the social security judges will identify jobs that you can do even with all of these difficulties. And even if you may not actually be able to work, they're going to find jobs that you can do and they're going to say that you can work. And it's really important to know and understand that system before you go into it so that you know what kind of evidence to have in your medical records to counteract those arguments from Social Security. Absolutely. And there's probably more details we can discuss as it's appearing to my head span, but I want to beat the clock. So um, for the sake of time, we're going to move to the icebreaker segment, which is my favorite part. It's so much fun. Let's do it. <laughs> so I'll start with the icebreaker question, um, which may come pretty simple to you because you have a book. But if you had to come up with a title or chapter for yeah. where your life is at at this precise moment in time, what would it be? Helping people. So we'll do a title and then I'll do a subtitle. How about that? Oh, okay, that's new. Yes. Helping people deal with the government, why it's nearly impossible. Um, I don't know. This is what I, what I came up with on the spot, right? That's but but the, the point good. being that um, the government, having worked as a government employee, but of course just being a citizen that has to do other things like register my car and get health insurance and figure out a way to get my COVID vaccinations, right? I've I've done both sides. I've had to deal with the government, but I've also been the government and seen other people have their frustrations talking to me as a government employee and trying to put myself in their position. And having been on both sides and and now having an appreciation for some of the things the government employees have to deal with, it doesn't make it easier to deal with the government, but I want to, you know, I my mission right now is to try and help explain to people where these government employees who are on salary and they're doing their 40 hours a week and, you know, they get 11 holidays a year and they're just thinking about themselves, right? There's themselves and their families and how do they not get fired from their job and the fact that they have to go to work on Monday at 9 a.m. So how do these people who have some desire for public service, but, you know, are really thinking more about themselves and their own lives than yours. How can you work with them to get what you need done and to help help them want to actually help you as a citizen? Right. I love that. I love the subtitle. I think that's the first. No one's done the subtitle. So I might have to add that in now. Um, my title, um, it doesn't have a subtitle. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's basically a mantra of which that started in 2020 and it's called warrior for change um i've shared a small caveat of i never used that word before until now caveat of who i am um basically since i was born um deficiencies up the wazoo um just to sum up i couldn't hear her talk so um Obviously, I'm having this conversation, so that particular impairment didn't really stuck, luckily. Um, so you've, I would I would say you've overcome it. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a more active phrasing of it didn't stick, but it's not like it didn't stick by accident. You did work and effort to overcome it. Yes, something that should be merely impossible as a result of that. So that tidbit of who I am 
is not an easy feat by any means. And I've had to overcome that and still overcome that in a way as a result of my deficiencies and making it incredibly difficult to find employment, which again brings us back to the topic of this conversation. Yeah, and I and I want to help people who have to like it's the people I, I think disabled people in the, Mer- the United States have to deal with more than anyone else because they have to deal with their own medical conditions and with treatment and with doctors who don't have all the answers and trying to really like basically help themselves through whatever it is they're going through. And then if if it's something that prevents that person from working, they have to go deal with the government telling them they can work when they know they can. And so that's my, if I'm a warrior for change, to steal your mantra for a moment. Yes, of course. It's to, it's to change people's perceptions of the government and, and to help people understand that they it is an entitlement. You are entitled to these benefits. You just have to understand how the system works so that you can go get them so that you can force the government to change their position with regard to your case. Because they're going to deny you. Most people get denied initially. And you have to fight through those first two denials. And you can get to a hearing with a judge. And and once you've changed your own mindset and understood that there are things you can do to give yourself a better chance of success, you can go, go then go do those things And then you can change the mind of the agency of the judge here in your case and convince that person why you should be approved. Yes, I love this conversation. Um, But on to the next part. And it's something I didn't share with you ahead of time because it's fun and it's not something my guests normally expect. And that is the icebreaker game. Um, So the icebreaker game is called Song Association. You don't have to be an avid singer to understand this game. You can be a karaoke singer, a shower singer, a yodeler, a whistler singer. Although, I don't think you can whistle any of these songs. If you can whistle these songs, my listeners, let me know. But um, all right. um, here's how the game works. I give you a word, and you can sing it, rap it, yodel it. Um, you actually have to try to sing it. Many guests have tried to change up this game by making up words, just saying the word and not actually singing. You're going to have to try to sing. I'm going to add that in here into this game because many people sing. I'll do my best. And then they don't sing and that kind of spoils the fun. However, my singing voice is terrible. It is not my, (laughs) I went to law school, not (laughs) singing school. I I understand. Um, however, this is where the fun part really kicks in. You don't have the luxury of time, more so than ever, because this interview is um limited due to Zoom. So yeah. um you have 15 seconds from the time I give you the word, or however long Zoom allows me to give Just you the one word. word. Um, there's three words, so um, Okay, go ahead. What's okay. the first word? Okay. <laughs> The first word is heart. Heart. And you just want me to like come up with some singing lines with the word heart? Yes, it has to be an actual song, not the name of an artist. Uh, a, a song that already exists or I have to make one up? Uh, we got a few minutes. We can I do this. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you lost that first word. So let's just go on wait, to wait, the wait. Is, do, is it a song that exists or do I have to make yes. It it's a song that exists. Oh yeah, you you had me on heart. Okay. Oh, I guess I guess Garth Brooks is like the first one that I thought of. So I'm happy to do it if you still want me to. Uh, if you want, you can. <laughs> don't tear my heart, my achy breaky heart. I just don't think you'd understand. I don't think Garth Brooks sings that song. Is that not Garth Brooks? I think that's really Ray Cyrus. <laughs> But um, you're, I'm sh- I, I'm a hundred percent sure that you're correct. <laughs> but at least, at least, I at least no, you're totally right. It's Billy Ray Cyrus. At least I didn't say it was like pink, right? At least I was in the right okay. genre. Right. Um. Just that for sorry. All right. Next fine. word. You can't next look word. up the songs either while you're doing this. So the no, next- I looked it. I looked it up afterwards. Okay. Which is, of course, I did because I got it wrong. Right. 
Okay, let's keep going. The next word is words. Words? Yes. Along with the word words. You got me. I can't think of a single song that has the word words, singular or plural in it. I'm trying. <laughs> well, um, this will be if the you... part where I give you an example. Okay. So first one, um, which you got wrong. Um, I there, did. There is a song called More Than Words by the band Extreme. Many yeah. have given this answer. Um, I know the song because it's covered by another band. I want to say Westlife or LFO. Um, those are popular pop bands, so my audience don't um throw guitars at me for getting that mixed up. Can I play the I'm 40 card and that I might not know popular <laughs> pop bands? Well, this was like in the 90s, so that's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. You, you stumped me on one. All right, we can do All one right. more. I think we have time for one yes. more. We only have one more left. So the last word is break. Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. <laughs> I was not thinking of I, that. There's not the word break in it. Wow. First thing that popped into my mind. <laughs> uh, well, we can keep doing songs all day long. But I got one though, right? That yeah. that one is a fair. I got you one. Got one. You that's definitely you... got one. When it comes to music, that's a win. One out of three for me is a win. <laughs> Uh, well, Spencer, um, before my time runs out, yeah, um, thank you so much for appearing on this episode, sharing your insight. Um, please share before <laughs> we wrap up here where people can find your book. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> In Social Security Disability Revealed, why it's so hard to access benefits and what you can do about it. And we're on Amazon. Uh, Barnes and Noble, Apple, Bookshop.org, paperback and ebook. You can also ask your local library to get either one, and links for everything so that you don't have to worry about where to find it. There's links for all of that at our website, which is bishinspublishing.com, b-i-s-h-i-n-s publishing.com. You can uh, also get links for our social media, which is at Bishins Publishing on Facebook and Instagram at Bishon's Pub on Twitter. On our website, we also have a description of the book and the table of contents. If you want to look through that and make sure this seems like the right kind of book for you. And also I put some links to interviews. So if for any reason you <laughs> want to hear me sing the Kit Kat theme song again, which we probably don't even have like the licensure rights for, right? But it's already done by now. <laughs> you could go on the website and listen to that but probably it'll be more useful to click on the social media links and all the places to buy the book and the table of contents awesome thank you so much for joining me spencer don't disappear quite yet um to my audience thank you for joining us in this episode if you enjoyed it if you want spencer to come back and do another round of songs for the entire episode um here are the following ways to do that you can find us on Facebook, Words of Our Podcast. We're also on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google. Um, basically, you can hear this episode anywhere that there are ears. Um, if you are listening to it from the moon, I come in peace. Um, it's 2022. Intergalactic broadcasting can happen. Let's make it happen. But until then, from all of us here on Earth, Thank you again, Spencer Bishens. <laughs> yep, Bishens. You got it. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thank you too, so much. Um, so again, to all my listeners, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, to anyone, particularly with disabilities of any kind, invisible or non-invisible, um, I am here for you. I am with you. Disabilities <laughs> and the world should be recognized and we should all be treated equally so equal equal, ah, equal rights and all spectrums of people and until next time